Good evening. Welcome. We are live from Coral Gables, Florida here on the World Wide Web. Just a reminder to our internet audience, for those of you watching, please give us a call here at the store during tonight's presentation. We'll get a copy of the book signed for you. We'll ship it to you for free of charge for the shipping anywhere here in the U.S. And for those of you that are here, please silence your cell phones. Don't uh, forget to pick up a copy of our Books and Books newsletter on your way out this evening. And also go to our website at booksandbooks.com. You can give us your email address there so we can keep you alerted to everything that goes on here at Books and Books. Um, we're also available on Facebook and Twitter. Tonight, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman and Shrinks, the untold story of psychiatry. Psychiatry has come a long way since the days of chaining lunatics in cold cells and parading them as freakish marbles before a gaping public. But as Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman reveals in his extraordinary and eye-opening book, the path to legitimacy for the black sheep of medicine has been anything but smooth. In Shrinks, Dr. Lieberman traces the field from its birth as a mystic pseudoscience through its adolescence as a cult of shrinks to its late blooming maturity beginning after World War II as a science-driven profession that saves lives. With fascinating case studies and portraits of the luminaries of the field with Sigmund Freud and Eric Kandel, Shrinks is a gripping and illuminating read and is an urgent call to arms to dispel the stigma of mental illness by treating them as diseases rather than unfortunate states of mind. Dr. Lieberman is the Lawrence C. Cole Professor and Chairman of Psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and Director of the New York State Psychiatric Institute. In 2000, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Institute in Medicine. He lives in New York City. Please give your warmest books and books. Welcome to Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman. I don't get the, I don't get the microphone? Oh. oh, I got my own microphone. <laughs> And in conclusion, I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, particularly in this venue, because uh, Books and Books is really a, a cultural beacon uh, of enlightenment for really our society, and in particular the city of Miami. And so be able to do a book event here is sort of like being asked to give mass, you know, in the Vatican by the Pope. <laughs> so thanks to Mitch Kaplan and Books and Books. <laughs> so being a good Jewish boy, I suppose it was uh, kind of ethnically destined for me to become a doctor, uh, but not necessarily a psychiatrist. And uh, I think that the way I became a psychiatrist was when I entered college and uh, took introductory psychology among my pre-med courses, uh, I read, as was required, um, Freud's Introduction to Dreams. And for anybody who reads Freud, you realize that this is an individual who was a, just a genius. He had a towering intellect, but uh, even more important is that he was a brilliant communicator. Everybody he spoke to was captivated by his... Uh, ideas, and he also wrote with a clarity and a uh, uh, incisiveness that really drew people in. And so reading Freud at that time to somebody who was just coming into maturity and adulthood um, was a way of opening a window into knowing you know, how you became who you are and what caused you to behave the way you do. And I thought, wow, this is, this is really interesting. Um, but then, at the same time, just by dint of uh, uh, coincidence, you know, timing, meaning you know, when my parents happened to get together and there was a glint in my father's eye and I was conceived, um, I was in college in the 60s. And in the 60s, there was a, a lot of cultural turmoil going on. And uh, all involved with that was some degree of experimentation with recreational drugs. Now, I was a fairly risk-aversive person who uh, was serious about my studies and profession, so I didn't sort of plunge in and sort of indulge myself in all manner of substances, but thought about it and eventually decided to uh, experiment with uh, hallucinogens, which were substances that were not so hedonistic, but were more so-called mind-expanding. And uh, I decided to sort of trip. And I uh, had an experience <laughs> with LSD. So I and my 
friends uh, sort of planned out what we would do, when we would take it, what kind of uh, map we would do through the campus of the uh, university we were at. And uh, we then spent the next six hours roaming through the campus, experiencing the effects of LSD. And it was a, really an a, uh, incredibly powerful and uh, unusual experience. Um, don't know how many of you in the audience you know, sort of have that sort of uh, experience or not. I'm not going to ask, and you don't have to raise your hands. Um, but it's amazing the fact that you can take a minute quantity of a substance, in this case 50 micrograms of lysergic acid diethylamide, and it takes you from who you are and the way you've experienced the world for however old you are and makes you see things totally differently and experience them in a way which is entirely different. And um, you become sort of immersed with your environment. Sensory stimulation becomes enhanced. You have all these profound thoughts. You think you're all of a sudden understanding the mysteries of the universe and God's wisdom and so forth. And as I was doing this, I was thinking, oh, God, this is amazing. I've got to write this down because you know, I'll, I'll never remember it. So I was taking copious notes you know, throughout the uh, experience, and um, then it was over. And uh, afterwards, uh, I had sort of two things which I think kind of solidified my interest in the brain in addition to what had happened with Freud. One of them was that, um, well, you know, the one thing I think that I may have in common with Stephen Jobs, because it certainly isn't financial success, <laughs> uh, is the fact that we both thought that LSD changed our lives. Um, but in his case, you know, he thought that he had really provided him with kind of profound wisdom that influenced his thoughts about how he would, you know, uh, proceed in life. Um, but in my case, it was less that than it was the idea that such a small quantity of a pharmacologic agent should produce such a profound change in a mental state. Because if it could do that, then maybe other mental states could be induced, whether it's enlightenment, whether it's altered state of consciousness, or mental illness, as a result of the same kind of phenomenon. <coughs> And perhaps there were inborn chemical or biologic processes that would induce this. Um, but the other thing that occurred was that um, the next day, after I had obviously sobered up, um, I took out my notes and read them, thinking, OK, I'm going to sort of see what these like, profound thoughts were and see what I could, how I could apply them to my life. And it was like you know, sophomoric gibberish. It like read like uh, nothing that was very enlightened or interesting or even <laughs> or even coherent. And so what it was is just really the having the kind of investment in the experience. But so what remained there was simply the lesson of neurochemistry, that who we are, how we think, the way we behave, is ultimately reducible to biologic phenomena that are occurring in the brain. And that was both uh, scary, but also really, really cool. So when I went to medical school, uh, I sort of continued with uh, thinking about this and ultimately decided to pursue psychiatry. And did so, trained in psychiatry, got a job, began pursuing a career. And the career that I chose was in the area of academic psychiatry, meaning that I worked in a university setting. And I did research. And the area of research that I focused on was in the area of psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder, psychotic depression. Um, but I also always was a clinician taking care of patients. And I had a practice. And 30 years later, uh, I was extremely gratified, and I think we had learned a lot about what had happened in the interim in terms of the way scientific progress had produced an increased awareness of the brain, behavior, 
mental disorders and gained a great deal of clinical experience. So from the standpoint of a job and a living and a, a fulfilling profession, I think I was lucky and it had worked out. But at the same time, I was profoundly disturbed. Uh, in fact, I was more than disturbed, I was angry. And the reason I was angry was because <clears throat> I had learned that over the course of my career, psychiatry had evolved from the 1970s to the 21st century from a period where the theoretical orientation of psychiatry and psychiatric medicine, the medical profession, mental health care providers largely was uh, understood through Freudian psychoanalytic theory to a point where we understood that that really was an interesting theory, but it was not explanatory in a very accurate and proven and informative way when it came to mental illness. And that we had learned a lot more from things that had occurred subsequently to the uh, development of Freud's theory and its really gaining prominence and domination within the United States. And that was through psychopharmacology, through the advent of neuroimaging methodology with MRI and PET scanning, through the uh, emergence of genetics, particularly molecular genetics, and then the development of neuroscience, a discipline which brought to bear all the scientific disciplines in the study of the brain. And um, even though there was this sea change in the knowledge base, the competence of psychiatry and what it could really do for people, um, old attitudes had prevailed. And as a result of that, there was still a tenacious persistence of stigma and prejudices against mental illness and psychiatry. Now, a lot of this was understandable given what had happened for the preceding 150 plus years. But regardless of that, the net effect of it was that many people, millions of people, if you do the math in terms of the epidemiology, were deterred from seeking treatment, either because they just didn't know that they were sick or because they were ashamed to come forward and acknowledge it, or they didn't know what to do or where to go to find good treatment. And the analogy that I, I sort of use to illustrate is imagine you have a population, population of Miami, the population of Florida, the population of the United States, and they're suffering a variety of different infectious diseases, whether it's the flu or whether it's um, uh, malaria, whether it's uh, polio, whether it's uh, uh, Ebola, whether it's AIDS, whether it's pneumonia. And many of the people, most of the people, were not getting antibiotics, hadn't had vaccines to prevent these, or weren't being offered protease inhibitors or antiretroviral treatments because there was uncertainty. So it's like Jenny McCarthy has been doing with vaccines, which begat <laughs> the measles epidemic. But this is happening pervasively in the field of mental illnesses for decades. Now the reality is, is that um, if this had been the 1940s or early 1950s, it would have been understandable because at that time there really was not extant treatments for mental illnesses. There was nothing that really could be done. But that's different now. But the old attitudes prevailed. And I have numerous cases, I mean, just in new, I could keep you here all night telling you stories that I think would astound you. But let me just tell you a couple, um, just to illustrate the point that I'm, I'm, I'm making. So um, these are all true stories. And in the book, all of the stories that uh, are described as case histories are real people. And the names, of course, have been changed. And the identities, have, of course, have been changed to sort of uh, protect their confidentiality. But the book opens with a story uh, of a girl named Elena. So she's a college student uh, at an Ivy League institution. And she's the daughter 
of a very famous person. I can't tell you what profession or who, but it's a household name. And uh, he and his wife come to see me about the 20-year-old daughter because she had been forced to drop out of Yale and because uh, she hadn't been f doing well and hadn't been behaving properly. And for two years after that, she was sent to all manner of different types of uh, therapists, a motivational coach, a self-esteem therapist, a wilderness camp, a new age therapist, until one day she was supposed to meet her mother for lunch in Manhattan, and she gets on a subway to go meet her mother, and some guy on the train, sleazy, you know, unsavory kind of person, inveigles her to come off the train, a vulnerable young girl, and go back to his apartment. And she does so, and the mother, when she doesn't show up, begins to get worried, and then she becomes frantic. She calls the police, and they trace her through her cell phone. Police rush over there and find where she is, and they rescue her. And when they tell this to their family doctor, they said, for crying out loud, why don't you take her to a real doctor? So they ended up coming to see me. But they did everything possible to avoid the uh, possibility that they had, their daughter had a mental disorder. And even when, after we did the evaluations and I told them, look, your daughter has a psychotic illness. I believe it is schizophrenia. Uh, we can't help her, but uh, she probably should come into the hospital. Um, this was very unwelcome news. They reluctantly agreed. She came into the hospital. She got better. But after she left, they kind of went their own way and decided to do their own thing. Um, ultimately, there was a happy ending, but I won't go through that. That's the epilogue to the book. Um, uh, but it just shows you the extent of somebody who was prominent, wealthy, should have access to the best, did everything they could to avoid this. Another case, which is even more astonishing, was um, I was at the University of North Carolina before I came to Columbia. And shortly after I arrived at Columbia, New York, uh, I was called to see a patient, do a consult on a patient on the floor. And uh, it was a medical patient, not a psychiatric patient. And I'm saying, well, why are they calling the chairman? You usually call one of the doctors that's assigned to take care, but it's a VIP. So this was an Asian woman who was 65 years old and the wife of a very prominent uh, Asian industrialist. And she was in the hospital for a severe skin infection. And uh, when I walked into the room, I immediately became aware of why I was called, or why a psychiatric counsel was called. Um, she was argumentative, incoherent, uh, accusing me of all kinds of things. And it was clear that she was delusional and psychotic. I went and read her chart, and I discovered that she was 65 from a well-born Asian family. She had graduated from medical school and was a doctor, never practiced because she developed schizophrenia at the same time. But she was never treated. The family kept her at home in a wing of their estate for 30 years. It was like uh, Jane Eyre. And so I, I invited the father and to come in, in, and visit and talk about this and what could be done. And he showed up kind of reluctantly with his adult children. and. They verified what I had discerned from the uh, history. And I said, well, you know, um, 30 years ago, there may not have been good treatments, but there are now. And uh, I think she really has the potential to improve. And it could really change her way of life and ability to sort of function and, and relate to you. And we went through a lengthy discussion. They wanted to think about it. Came back a couple days. I suggested they could transfer her when she was medically stable to the psychiatric unit. They said, no, it would be too disruptive. It would change kind of the situation in the community and would be too problematic. So she was discharged, and I'm sure she's being well taken care of, but no treatment. Now, the power of stigma in Asia is even worse than here, and that's a very good example. Now, I'll show you one more example. Uh, which has sort of a happier ending. Um, early in my career, when I was uh, in training, uh, I had a patient that was referred to me. And she was a 40-year-old woman married into, uh, this was in 
She lived in a beautiful townhouse in Greenwich Village. She had married into one of the uh, original Dutch families of New York. Uh, her husband was in the banking business, and uh, she had several children. And um, the woman was referred to me by her friend who I was treating, who was her neighbor, because she hadn't gone out of the house in 15 years. And so I made a house call, and uh, after doing an evaluation, it was immediately clear. I mean, this wasn't even a diagnostic challenge that she had what's called panic disorder. It's an anxiety disorder where somebody has fulminant episodes of fear associated with physical symptoms, pounding heart, shortness of breath, flushing. Uh, and as a result, people become phobic and they don't want to go out because they're afraid this is going to happen in public, so they became more restrictive and it's called panic disorder with agoraphobia. So I saw her at home, uh, prescribed medication, said we need to do some kind of conditioning to reverse the phobia. And uh, after some period of time, she was well enough to come see me in the clinic. She would come to the clinic, but she wouldn't come in and sit down. She would stand by the door and she, would, she rode her bicycle to the clinic. She would keep her bike, she wouldn't put the bike downstairs outside of the building. She would bring it up and put it in the hallway and she would stand there right by the bike in case she had to sort of escape. Um, and then gradually she sat down and then eventually she left the bike and soon she began taking her kids to school, engaging in the activities, the PTA and so forth, and joining her husband, socializing as a woman is expect to in his line of business. Um, and that could have happened 15 years ago. And so one of the gratifying things in this field is the fact that you really can make a change in people's life. But it's oftentimes very, very late in coming. So it was really that realization that in the past, it was the lack of knowledge and the lack of treatment which really was the limiting factor in people being able to uh, overcome whatever their symptoms were and their illness was. Uh, but at that point in time, when after things had changed, um, the deterrent was really the prevailing adi old attitudes, the stigma, the prejudices of the past, and they still persist. They still persist. Um, psychiatry has a number of kind of dubious distinctions. Um, one of them is that it's the only medical specialty that has an anti-movement. I mean, have you ever heard of an anti-cardiology movement? or an anti-dermatology movement, or an anti-orthopedics movement, but there's an anti-psychiatry movement. It's a very virulent movement, uh, which began in the 1960s. And it was actually a, a collaboration between a psychiatrist, you know, you've heard the expression of self-hating something or other. This was a self-hating psychiatrist named Tom Azaz who collaborated with uh, L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology fame to form the first anti-psychiatry organization. Um, but this still persists to this day. So what I'm telling you and what the book was intended to try and do was to set the record straight, help to dispel the stigma, tell the story of psychiatry in terms of its you know, unvarnished uh, history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and say, whereas there were limitations and problems and misdeeds that occurred previously, that's not the case now, and that anyone who may be in need of treatment should not be reluctant to seek it because of either a lack of awareness or a skepticism as to whether there's anything out there or they're going to be taken advantage by charlatans or snake oil salesmen. Um, so you may be asking yourself, well, well okay, uh, why, why, did, why, you know, why did this take so long and, and why this sort of anomaly of, of, of prejudice against this area and this discipline? Um, two reasons. Uh, one has to do with the fact um, that uh, psychiatrists did some bad things. Um, when in the 19th century when medical science began to 
pursue research on human disease, progress was made in virtually all of the other medical specialties, uh, but less so in psychiatry. And psychiatry, in its desperation to try and do something that would, one, give it some kind of legitimacy, and two, provide treatment, um, enacted some theories and some treatments that right now, looking at it from our perspective, seem pretty stupid and uh, barbaric. So, you know, you've got the issue of the first Nobel Prize ever given for psychiatry was for malaria therapy. This was in the 1920s, 1929. And um, this was an Austrian doctor who injected the blood of people who had malaria into psychiatric patients who were insane uh, to induce a fever because he thought that fever would uh, eliminate the psychosis. Um, the reality, and so why did they give him a Nobel Prize? Well, they gave him a Nobel Prize because it actually did. Fever did ameliorate the psychosis and make people calm for a period of time, but it turned out that the only people in the mental asylum that, that worked for were people that had tertiary syphilis. Without antibiotics, if syphilis entered the brain, the nervous system, it could produce a condition which mimicked schizophrenia. But all the people that had bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, psychotic depression, they weren't helped. But that shows you the desperation. And then, of course, there was the uh, lobotomies uh, and the idea of using these ice pick lobotomies that Walter Freeman in the United States developed. Um, and then there was Freud, who developed this brilliant theory of the mind and human behavior, but it carried with it some things we now look at as being kind of preposterous. You know, things like um, you know, penis envy, castration complex, Oedipal complex. But he also invented ideas in his theory that are still consistent with what we know in cognitive neuroscience that were revolutionary, such as understanding the unconscious versus the conscious, because at that time, humans and the, 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 the state of our knowledge was that everything that we did and knew we were aware of. We didn't know anything about implicit memory and unconscious biases. And the idea of defense mechanisms, rationalization, sublimation, denial, and so forth. So he was brilliant, um, but his theory was then extended by his disciples to anything and everything. And that begot things like blaming the parents for mental illness. So one of his disciples, Frieda Fromm Reichman, who was the uh, psychiatrist in the book I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, um, she coined the term schizophrenogenic mother. And uh, then there was also the concept when autism was first described in the scientific literature of the refrigerator mother who was kind of cold, distant, and remote and induced this condition in the children. And then there was maybe the most uh, heinous uh, uh, sort of exploitation of psychiatry of all, homosexuality. Homosexuality was considered a disorder. And it was because of a dominant, overbearing mother and a, an effete, weak, effeminate father. So psychiatry did some bad things. Now, the point I would make in its defense is that it wasn't because people were venal or stupid. It was because they were desperate, because there was no knowledge and no way to really gain traction and develop understanding and treatments. So it took longer. <clears throat> so why did it take longer? It took longer because the area of medicine that psychiatry covers, you know, cardiology covers the heart, gastroenterology the stomach, uh, uh, you know, pulmonology the, the lungs, nephrology the kidneys. Um, so psychiatry and neurology cover the brain. And psychiatry covers the part of the brain that's the most highly evolved part of the brain. So the brain is really an anomalous organ. It's so different from 
any other organ of the body by virtue of its complexity. A hundred billion neurons, 30 trillion connections compared to the heart, which is basically a pump with muscles and four chambers, kidney, which is a filter, the GI system, which is a porous tube. And the brain is conducting a myriad of functions simultaneously. I mean, it's regulating your temperature, your respiration, your heart rate, your satiety, while you're sitting here listening to me and you're thinking about what you're going to do afterwards and what you're going to have dinner and you may be thinking about you know, the next idea for your latest uh, great American novel. And all these things are happening simultaneously. How does it do it? So psychiatry got left the organ and the area, the functions of the organ that were the most complicated in the universe and in the animal kingdom. And it took a long time to begin to sort of figure that out. But it has begun to figure it out. And it is able to sort of make progress now. But for reasons that have to do with some of the most deep-seated prejudices within humanity and society, it continues to be criticized and suffer. And OK, that'll work itself out over time as progress in research identifies causes, produces a diagnostic test for depression instead of simply a retinue of symptoms for depression, um, and is able to maybe through genetics kind of deconstruct the subtypes within a given diagnostic category and develop better treatments, that will uh, all change. The um, question is, is, when will the stigma change? And it's, it's amazing. There, it's, it's still anomalous. Uh, and I'll just give you sort of two anecdotes uh, before sort of uh, concluding. Um, one is, is I, 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 part of my job is now to spend a lot of time fundraising just because of the financial pressures that are impacting on academic medicine now with our government's inability to figure out how it finances health care and fund biomedical research. Um, and so one time I was asked to uh, speak at a fundraiser given by a uh, kind of prominent, socially prominent uh, woman in New York who had lost her son who had uh, bipolar disorder to suicide. And uh, I went there and it was in a nice midtown restaurant and she had a number of her friends and acquaintances were invited, very fashionable, educated, sophisticated group. And I give my talk after mingling and take questions afterwards. And um, everybody was very admiring and uh, complimentary of the hostess. And, but I noted that it was like it was they're complimenting her for having done something like Angelina Joe Lee was doing in, in Angola or somebody. You know, it was like, you know, I can relate to the need to do something for the tsunami victims in Indonesia or the hurricane victims in Haiti, as opposed to something that's affecting everybody here, like we're worrying about if we're going to get Alzheimer's disease or not. Um, but then after that, in the weeks that followed, I got phone calls from, I would say, half of the people there asking me if they could help, if I could help them with something about themselves or a family member or a friend. So I'm thinking to myself, what other specialty medicine do you have people who are getting a referral based on a chance meeting with a social acquaintance as opposed to going through their family doctor or you know, a reputable sort of hospital. But that's sort of the process that people adopt because of this kind of uh, temerity and uh, uneasiness with trying to seek it or how, in, how to find it. Um, the other anecdote, let's see, what was the other anecdote? Um, <laughs> I can't remember. Well, this is a senior moment. <laughs> um, so at any rate, um, the reality is, is that uh, this process is one which is moving in the right direction, albeit slowly. Uh, when people express their complaints like, God, when I see a patient, and this is not an uncommon experience, and you treat them either for depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and they actually improve, respond to treatment, um, they'll say, my God, is this how normal people live? Is this how it's supposed to be? 
and I could have done this years ago. Um, it's very gratifying, and there is really hope for people, um, even though there is this still prejudice, stigma, you know, kind of double standard. Um, so uh, the process is moving forward, but it's moving forward slowly. And when people sort of complain, well, well why isn't more done? Why don't we have even better treatments without side effects? Um, I say it may not be perfect, but it's better now than it's ever been in, in the course of human history. And actually in the United States, it's better than any other part of the world. So it's a glass half full as opposed to half empty. And it's my firm belief uh, that this process will continue and even at a more accelerated rate, meaning this rate of progress, improvement, dissipation of stigma, better care, uh, because the momentum in terms of scientific technology and biomedical research capability is extraordinary. And the rate limiting factor now is really the kind of resources we put behind it, and that rolls up to the government and sort of policy on this, which is maybe the next book. Um, but uh, so that's to try and put this in a very favorable and an optimistic context after what may have been a fairly ignominious and, and, and checkered history. So the whole purpose of the book, which is the first book I've ever written for the general public, was to try and put out the story from somebody who's been in the field for the period of time where the greatest progress, the, the, the inflection point in terms of the trajectory of the, the field has occurred. Um, and also, uh, I'll immodestly say, you know, I, I think I'm in a position to know by virtue of having been kind of at the leading edge of academic psychiatry and having been president of the American Psychiatric Association and so forth. Um, that psychiatry does have genuine benefits to offer people and the future is really bright. And the two things that are the biggest deterrents are one, the social attitudes and prejudice on one hand, and the other is, is how we finance health care, provide insurance benefits, and fund biomedical research on the other. So there's two things I would like to sort of say as sort of take-home messages. My wife's getting me the uh, stop sign. Um, <laughs> one, is, one is that um, for you or anybody you know, uh, you should not be deterred. And uh, there is positive assistance that can be provided. And the worst that can happen is you spend some money and little time to find out. It's not necessary for everybody. The shibboleth that everybody's a little crazy is not true. I mean, we all have problems of living, the worried well, the ups and downs of daily life, but there's a clear bright line between what are called mental illnesses and what aren't. And the second thing is, is that given that uh, no matter how much we know and can do, ultimately a rate limiting factor has to do with like government policy with respect to how healthcare is financed and how research is funded to continue progress to the extent that you have any uh, ability or communication or opportunities to convey this to the media on one hand and to the government sort of on the other, that's very important to do uh, because, uh, uh, as I say, ultimately there are the rate limiting factors. So I thank you for your attention and if we do have time, we'll take some questions. Folks, we do have time. We do have time for a few questions, but since I cannot get to everybody with the microphone, I'm going to ask the good doctor to repeat your question back so that everyone can hear it. So I think we have one right up here in the front, sir. So about uh, senior moments, <laughs> uh, what can you do about uh, slowing the frequency of senior moments and when is it that you know that it is more than just a senior moment and it becomes a psychiatric problem. So Especially for professions like academics that have to stand and lecture in front of <laughs> uh, Invariably in a university, younger people that don't have uh, any understanding of what a senior moment is. That's right. 
so the question is, is um, you know, what do you do about age-associated memory decline, and how do you know when it's uh, simply a normal aging process as opposed to the uh, prodrome of, of dementia? Um, so uh, first, everybody is prone to age-associated memory decline because that's the neurobiology of aging. The best way of uh, trying to uh, prevent that is things that will promote healthy aging. So we uh, don't know exactly what the kind of pharmacologic or the other types of sort of interventions are to prevent it, but there are certain lifestyle things you can do. Um, one is to get sleep. Uh, a second is to exercise. A third is, uh, and I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but a caloric restriction. If you reduce the amount of uh, daily calories that you consume, that does enhance sort of uh, uh, the resilience of cells in, in the brain. Um, there is a large sort of biology and effort to develop <coughs> pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals that will stimulate uh, cognitive enhancement and deter this kind of age process. And uh, I'm not a big proponent of like naturopathic and nutraceutical treatments, uh, but uh, there is one that a colleague of mine did a very rigorous study and showed that it's an effective agent specifically for this age-associated memory impairment. Um, it's in chocolate. It's called flavanol. So there was a paper that was published in Nature Neuroscience about uh, nine months ago by Scott Small. And um, he did this study funded by Nestle's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's a very serious scientist, I believe it. And to get into Nature Neuroscience is not easy, one of the top journals in the world. Um, and basically, he took this concentrated extract called flavanol, and uh, he showed that it stimulates, and he did this in rodents first, and then in, then in healthy volunteers, showed that it stimulates activity and neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which is the seat of memory. So um, when he published this thing, uh, this, this, this study, um, the company that produces this is called Coco Vida, Coco Vida. Um, <laughs> All of a sudden, like they became like uh, their their their, uh, their volume of business just skyrocketed. So, ultimately, um, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of research which is identifying genes which not only improve sort of uh, uh, retired brain aging, but are longevity enhancers. Uh, and these are the um, uh, a set of genes for which pharmaceuticals will ultimately develop. The question is whether it'll occur in time for our lifetime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if you have a, well, first of all, if you're 15, you know, it's, I wouldn't worry about it unless you're smoking a lot of marijuana. Um, but uh, if you're, you know, in middle age, if you're in middle age, so uh, you, you, if you have a serious concern, you should begin with your family doctor and then ultimately a neurologist or a geriatric psychiatrist. And they can do uh, neuropsychologic tests. They can do an MRI, which measures activity in that area of the brain. They can also do a PET scan, which can measure whether you have any kind of amyloid accumulation, which is really the uh, signature of Alzheimer's disease. So um, you can, you can uh, have these things done to alleviate your anxiety about this. Uh, the only problem is, is that if you do have, oh, and you know, also your family history is important and your genetics is important because there's an early onset form of Alzheimer's. The only problem is, is if you do have it right now, there's no effective treatment. Dr. Bornstein. How is it that uh, a mental uh, illness such as the one that must have inflicted the co-pilot not to be detected after rigorous, uh, you know, yearly examination? How, how does that have so, a person experience yeah, it? So, uh, it this is an esteemed colleague of ours who's, who's done some of the most groundbreaking work in human relations. <laughs> and I'm so glad you asked that. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad you asked that question. We have another esteemed colleague here, too. And you'll see if he wants to comment on this. Smart enough to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Do I hear Battle Creek? Um, so... Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because there's, I, I, actually, that was the second thing that I had the senior yeah. moment about. Um, two examples in the news lately illustrate the main theme of this, which is the stigma. 
Um, one is Robert Durst. So Robert Durst is a pretty weird guy. Looks like he, looks like he probably killed some people. Um, he, was, he was the scion of a wealthy real estate family who was strange from the beginning. I mean, as a kid, he was evaluated psycho psychologically. Um, and he then sort of led this kind of bizarre life. Uh, but because he was wealthy, he was considered eccentric and left on his own as opposed to anything done. So he was never really taken to be formally diagnosed or treated. And then this happened. So he, you know, the reason he came to light now is because he was the subject of this documentary. And then he goes in in the final episode into the bathroom and he, and he, and he confesses. So my take on this is that um, this guy was psychotic, probably with schizophrenia. Which from a Durst, Durst. And what about the pilot? Well, I, I'm kidding. I'm getting to him. I'm getting to him. I'm getting to him. Right. So as my good friend Patrick Kennedy said, why don't we have a, a check up from the neck up as well as the neck down? And um, so, you know, if we think about the fact that we're entrusting uh, our lives to pilots, and you know, we don't want them to have a heart attack. We don't want them to have a seizure. We don't have, want them to have a fainting spell. We don't have to want them to go into some kind of respiratory spasm. Um, why don't we sort of evaluate them in terms of their mental status? Uh, now, on one hand, you could say, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to know? You know, you don't really have a diagnostic test. Uh, so it is very labor intensive because you have to do an in-depth interview. Um, my suggestion would be, and it's going to be an expensive suggestion, is, is that people who are in positions that really uh, control the lives of individuals, whether it's police or you know, pilots, probably need some ongoing, as well as politicians, um, <laughs> so, so, some, some ongoing psychological surveillance. Not, not to put them under the microscope and to signify, but just simply to ensure that things aren't being done. I mean, people talked about you know, Reagan after uh, you know, he was the assassination attempt is you know, not being the same and obviously you know, having early stages of dementia. Um, not that he would have been impeached, but um, so these are things that we can do, but we don't do. Should I call him? Okay, ma'am? Uh, yes. It's a two part question. It's one when you see all these uh, children killing other children. And you know that that is a horrible endeavor. But what I saw was even in uh, Santa Barbara. You remember the yeah, 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 yeah. And their parents were always saying, "We're running after him. We gave him all. We took him to special schools. We went." And that's I think also the stigma when people think about psychiatry. Here's a wealthy family that didn't seem to run away from the problem, but always knew the child was strange, or even the one in. Uh, Connecticut, which was the case that the parents tried to do all and they had the means to do it. He was in Hollywood and tried all the time and it seemed like the yeah. system failed to the right. and then also right. in terms of... Right. So, so, so the question has to do with sort of mental illness and dangerousness yeah. and, 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 um, and that's what the, I think the public sees, you know, many times. Right. And then the frustration of the parents, well, like, well, where do I go? Yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, a hot topic right now. So you know, mental illness and violence. So, you know, violence, we have violence in our society. Um, if you talk about all violent crime, less than 4% is associated with anybody with mental illness. You know, but these are robberies, crimes of passion, you know, sexual assault, whatever. Um, if you talk, though, about intrafamily violence or civilian massacres, um, the rate, the rate, the rate, the rate uh, of uh, those that uh, is perpetrated by people with mental illness goes up to about 20 percent. Um, and uh, if you look at the civilian massacres, which is what gets the public attention specifically, uh, what you find out is that a substantial proportion of them are by people with a mental disorder that's either never or has now untreated. And to your question about Santa Barbara, you know, some are easy. And some are, are, are hard. So, you know, if you take, again, these civilian massacres, some are motivated by ideologic zealots, like this guy Major Hassan at uh, Fort Hood or Timothy McVeigh in, in Oklahoma. Um, but 
many are orchestrated by people with mental illness. So uh, Jared Loeffner, who shot Gabrielle Giffords and a number of people, floridly schizophrenic for years. Nobody did anything. He sat in a classroom in a community college. Everybody thought he was weird and menacing, either made fun or avoided him. I mean, if he had collapsed short of breath choking or he had a seizure or he had vomited or something or a chest pain that would have you know, tended to him, called 911, Russian murder, but because he was crazy, they called security and had him banned for the conference, uh, the, the, the campus. Um, James Holmes in Aurora, Colorado. So the guy in Santa Barbara, you're right. So he was different. So they didn't get treatment when they manifestly needed it. The guy in Santa Barbara, his name I forgot, um, he, his family in Los Angeles, son of a producer, um, was in, was evaluated by psychologists in school and had therapy. So I don't know because I haven't you know, really studied the case or gotten the information, but my, my impression is, is he had a condition which is called nonverbal learning disability. So the uh, frequency of what are called pediatric cognitive disorders, which we commonly know as dyslexia or ADHD, um, uh, are things that have been really uh, very much understudied. And within this category, there is a category of nonverbal learning disability. So verbal learning disabilities have to I can't read because I can't see the words in the proper syntax on the page or attention. I can't concentrate and focus on it. Nonverbal learning disabilities, are, you know, my, my verbal IQ is fine. You know, I can memorize things, I can understand things, but I have no social cognition. I don't know how to relate to people. And this guy, if you listen to him, he would say, girls hate me. You know, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't relate to people and he became, so this is a guess, you know, because I'm just you know, reading the news like you. Um, I, I think he, he, he got attended to, but he didn't get the right treatment. Oh, of, of well, how we treat it's, got, it's, 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 got, it's got plenty of reason to be ashamed of us. I mean, no, I be, beginning with PTSD. Yeah, no, but I'm just saying of mental illness. And when you see anyone on the street, the homeless, you know they have psychiatric problems. And what do they do? Put them in jail. Well, go know? to San Francisco. Well, I want to recognize Judge Steve Leifman here because, um, you know, just like I think Mitch is like a, a cultural hero, uh, Judge Leifman is a hero to those of us in the mental health and law enforcement professions because he's somebody who sort of stepped out of his... Uh, you know, conventional role to recognize a, uh, a, a shameful sort of deficiency in our society to try and do something by establishing legal systems that are understanding and sympathetic to the plight of people with mental illness. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Well, a lot of people say that, you know, what I advocate is, you know, all drugs and no psychotherapy. Um, that's not true. Uh, for most people with mental illness, uh, one of the most important, if not the most important thing, is having stable, supportive relationships. Uh, you see Beautiful Mind, the movie of Beautiful yes, Mind? Absolutely. So Sylvia Nasser is a good friend of mine. Um, what saved John Nash, you know, was really his wife. Um, so. Um, you know, it's, there was a, uh, a chairman of psychiatry at Yale in the 70s named Morton Reiser, and he was commenting on the shifting sands within the field of psychiatry that were occurring at the time with psychopharmacology and imaging and so forth. And he said, well, for the last 50 years, we've been a profession that's been brainless, and now we're going to be a profession that's mindless. <laughs> and, um, but that, that's not the case. And in the book, I try and make the point that really what psychiatry is is a pluralistic di discipline, is that you know, all, all physicians are supposed to really have as the cornerstone of their, of their practice uh, the relationship with the patient. But you know, mechanization being what it is and the pressures of healthcare financing and needing to see more patients quickly has really eroded that. And so somebody will look at your chart and your x-rays and your lab tests and say, OK, here's what you need. Goodbye. Um, psychiatry shouldn't and won't be that. Um, and I, I would say the only people that I treat who I treat only with uh, medications are people who don't want to talk. They say, Doc, 
Um, I'm love, I appreciate what you've done. You know, I'm going to come in every three months or every six months, get a prescription for antidepressant or lithium, and you know, do my lab tests, and, and, and that's all I need, um, and that's fine. But uh, I th the 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 optimal paradigm is really a combined treatment approach. Folks, we have time for one more question. One more. Um, there was a, a, an article in Time magazine that esteemed medical journal um, that <laughs> dis, 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 descri described a treatment, uh, a medication that uh, enhanced c compassion. I believe the, the, the agent was oxytocin. Yeah. So oxytocin is a naturally occurring hormone that's secreted in the pituitary, and uh, it has multiple effects. One of the effects is after childbirth, it produces constriction of the uterus, so that uh, uh, the mother doesn't bleed. Um, but it also uh, has an effect on behavior. And it, 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 it enha it's called a nona peptide. Uh, my wife loves it when I talk dirty like this. Um, and, um, and it enhances social affiliative behaviors. So if you have somebody who's kind of you know, like brusque and taciturn and uh, you know, not warm and fuzzy, and you give them some oxytocin, the uh, expectation is, is that they'll be a little more friendly and uh, you know, warm and so forth and so on. And there's a, a fair amount of evidence sort of supporting this. So this is basically an endogenous hormone which is doing it. Um, to the extent that it's being used now, it's not being used for personality changes. So uh, it's not like you're going to give it to your boss or something like that. <laughs> um, but it has been thought of as a treatment for autism. I, I think, but in the context of your question, uh, what it suggests is that this is the power of biomedical research. I mean, it's good and bad because there's some, some risks. I mean, the, the ability, the, you know, it ta you know the, the whole notion about the arc of human history and that what happens in terms of progress within like a decade now is what took centuries in the past. And this accelerated rate, the momentum and the capacity in terms of biomedical research to produce things that could completely change the human condition is extraordinary. And that's why our government is so you know, effed up by not really supporting it well. Because um, it could be, now at the same time there are risks. So I don't know if people have read this, but there was an article in the paper uh, in the past uh, week um, by these scientists that are geneticists. So within the field of molecular genetics, a new technique has been developed called, the acronym for which is called CRISP, CRISPR-Cas. And I mean, the whole human genome and the way gene, gene expression is uh, orchestrated is, is so amazingly complicated, but so fascinating. Um, and it's being kind of unraveled now, like you know, week by week in the scientific literature. So this CRISPR-Cas method enables you enables uh, um, uh, scientists to sort of insert a uh, kind of a, 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 a vector which can um, activate or suppress sort of genes in the same way that viruses do when they cause you know the flu or the cold or something, but it can do it like on an enduring basis, not a transient basis. So it's really been incredible. However. It really opens the door to this kind of, um, you know, sort of genetic engineering. I mean, in a way that we thought about before, but wasn't necessarily that practical. Uh, and and the scientists came out in the article and said, we think that this needs to be banned. You know, we discovered it, and it's very powerful, but we think that it needs to be banned. So, you know, there there is sort of a, a, a double-edged uh, uh, side of these things, um, but. The reality is, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so optimistic, the only thing that I'm pessimistic about is the government. And this is the last anecdote, and I'm going to stop. <laughs> we have a graduation for our residents every year. And at the graduation, in, and we get 
great. I mean, these kids are so smart. It's unbelievable. Um, and at the graduation last June, the best resident of the class, and, and maybe I've ever you know, sort of taught or seen, um, is graduating. Uh, and um, he introduced me to his girlfriend. And uh, I say, oh, hi, are you in the medical profession? He says, no, no, I'm not. I work at the UN. I said, what do you do at the UN? He said, I'm a political scientist. So I said, you're a political scientist, huh? He says, yeah. So I said, is that an oxymoron? <laughs> what is scientific about politics? I mean, I, I, you know, I think that the governmental system is the biggest problem in our society. At any rate. Thank you, Dr. Lieberman. Thank you very much. You've all received an hour of free talk therapy. I hope you realize that. <laughs> Thank you so much. For those of you watching online, we still have time for you to give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you. For those of you that are here, the books are for sale behind the counter. Uh, Dr. Lieberman will be sitting here signing. Uh, if I could ask you to fold your chairs when you rise, that would give us some room in here, and you can ask the doctor some more questions. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.